Lord to bless our time. It is in the afternoon, and I realize uh, many of the saints have headed off to a nap, so hopefully uh, those of you who are here are able to understand and to deal with the material. We're going to look at evil in terms of a philosophic analysis. There is a time and a place to do this. Uh, the biblical justification is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where after Paul declared all heathen philosophy foolishness in chapter 1, he said, but we who are of God, we do have our own philosophy. Christian philosophy means a Christian view of man and science, biology and history. There is a Christian view of man. Only the gospel tells us why one plus one equals two. That's why in modern math, that has collapsed. One plus one could equal zero. It doesn't necessarily mean two anymore. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Our Father of God, we ask that you would quicken our minds and our hearts to receive these things. We ask that we will grow in our understanding of the solution to the problem of evil that you have revealed to us in Scripture and in your Son. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. What we first do is see this word evil. Um, unless you really define it carefully and understand what we're talking about, you're just babbling. Often when I deal with an atheist, an atheist says, what about the problem of evil? What about the problem of evil? I said, well, what about you? You're evil, your thoughts are evil, your deeds. What problem of evil are you having in your life right now? Drug addiction, pornography, a bad relationship. Well, I, 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 I don't mean that, I mean evil. I said, well, evil means something that's afflicting you with pain and suffering. Someone has died, you broke your leg, your marriage went. What evil do you have in your life now that needs an explanation? And usually they say, oh, well, forget it. I don't want to discuss it anymore. As long as you don't define the term, they get away with it. Another typical atheist, what about the heathen? I said, well, what about you? What? I said, what about you? You're a heathen. It just means someone who doesn't believe. So what about you? Are you really concerned about the heathen? Do you give money to missions? Most questions are actually rejections of the gospel and they expect you to cower. So the moment you say, well, what about the heathen? They expect you to put your spiritual leg between, uh, the spiritual tail between your legs and scuttle off. But you know, Jesus did. Paul did. Uh, Elijah did. He didn't faint with the prophets of Baal. Christians must take courage and follow the example of Scripture. Now we're going to look at evil, and these are now the roots. The first thing that goes along is the subject of metaphysics. The word metaphysics is made up of two words, meta, which means after, physics referring to an analysis of physical reality or science. This is a term from Aristotle. He said, after we've looked at biology and zoology, and we've looked at the, those things, now we're going to talk about essence and being, that is, the existence of things. The metaphysics of anything means that you have to ask, first of all, are we talking about something that exists? Does evil exist? Well, immediately you're going to have only two possible answers. The first is what? No. And the other is yes. Now, in traditional Eastern and Western philosophy, evil does not exist. So as you go down, evil is an illusion. It is something that is myth, something that doesn't exist, and it's not real. That's why Eastern, relig Eastern religions in Hinduism it is called my own illusion. There is no such thing as evil. The same thing when you get to uh, 
the mind sciences such as Christian science. Mary Baker Eddy said there is no such thing as evil, no such thing as sin, because there is no such thing as matter. There is no flesh, there is no body. And to have a little chant uh, that said, God is all, God is good, therefore all is good, and there is no evil. If God is all, and God is good, then all is good, there is no evil. All is good. Doesn't that sound nice? I was driving the head of one of these New Age cults into New York City, and uh, Sue George was her name. She had created the church, the Church of Universal Mind. And of course, I, I enjoyed quizzing her. I said, what is matter? Uh, well, it's never mind. And what is mine? Never matter. And see, they can't define their terms except by the exclusion. One is what's left over when you remove the other. But I said, now you believe that there's no such thing as evil. She said, absolutely, there's no such thing as evil. And I took out my car keys, well, her car keys from her pocketbook, a lot of keys, and I began to shake the keys. And she's seated on the front seat. She said, what are you doing? I said, the bell is tolling, and it's tolling for thee. If there is no evil, why do you lock your apartment? Why do you lock your office? Why do you lock your car? Why do you keep your money in the bank? If there is no evil, just leave everything out in the open. I said, matter of fact, as we come into Manhattan, uh, the northern part uh, from up near Brewster, I'm going to drop you off in Harlem around 130th Street at a black alley, a very dark alley. You walk on down that alley, and I think you're going to meet evil. <laughs> and she said, no, there is no evil. I said, you could look at the grave of my three-year-old daughter who had been murdered and then torn to pieces by some murderous, vicious person and tell me, looking into that casket, there is no evil. Yes, there is no evil. But can they live what they believe? Mary Baker Eddy said there is no such thing as death. Guess what? She died. Now when she died, they drove her around in a carriage for three days around Boston saying that she's going to resurrect herself on the third day. By the third day, she stinketh. <laughs> they buried her with a live phone in her casket, expecting any time, Mrs. Mary, get me out, get me out. We also have found out that Mary Baker Eddy secretly went to the dentist. Now, Christian science doesn't believe in going to dentists or doctors or chiropractors. That's what she preached. But how long can you resist the power of a toothache? Any of you have an abscess or a real bad? Well, you can chant there is no pain. In the end, what you're gonna, you're gonna go sneak off to a dentist. The idea that there is no existence to evil, that is an illusion, is what I call the ostrich head in the sand approach. And of course, it is where Buddhism and Hinduism and other uh, forms of Eastern religion, and as I said, the mind sciences, a Christian science, Scientology, science of the mind, religious science, uh, where all of that stuff is. They're all in the same book. Evil does not exist. But the reality of it is such, they die. They experience pain. And it doesn't work. Now, if you say no, you can also go to Greek philosophy. Now, the Greek philosophers did not say that evil was an illusion. They defined it away by saying evil is the absence of good. How many of you heard the definition, the absence of good? Which simply tells you it doesn't exist. It's a vacuum. There's nothing there. And this was the hope of the Greek philosophers. The trouble is that doesn't answer anything. 
The absence or a vacuum, how does that explain anything having to do with evil? The absence of good is simply a way of saying getting rid of the issue. And of course, do they have to die like everybody else? If their parents die and their legs get broken? Uh, Mark Twain wrote a book against Christian science about a guy who fell down the mountain and broke his leg. And the Christian science practitioner met up on the way and said, you have no leg. All is matter, all is mind, there is no matter, you have no leg, and therefore there cannot be any pain, it's an illusion. And he just simply showed how ridiculous it is. After Mark Twain died, the Christian Science Church bought the copyright to his works, took out that volume, and until just recently when the copyright ran out, if you bought the works of Mark Twain, you would not get that volume which refuted Christian science. But here with the Greek philosophers, the absence of good really doesn't explain anything. It just tells us, well, it's a vacuum. Or again, if we deal with secular humanism, not Eastern religion, the Maya or sciences, New Age, we go from Greek, now we go to secular humanism and it says, everything is relative, thus nothing is really evil, one, person's evil is another person's good. So a cannibal who eats a human being, to him it is good. To you it is evil. And so they would say, what is evil to you is evil to you. What is good to you, it's every individual decides and it's all relative. There actually isn't in any really good or evil at all. Relativism, of course, leads to the destruction of any dealing with it. If you say that evil is an illusion or it's an absence of good or relativism, do you think any of these views motivated people to build hospitals? If you don't believe that evil exists, are you going to build a building to alleviate it? No, you don't find orphanages, hospitals, hospices. You don't find that where that kind of thinking is dominant. Where you begin to find concrete ways to deal to alleviate evil is when you say, yes, evil does exist, it is real. And thus realism means evil is real, pain is real, suffering is real, death is real, get a grip, it's part of reality, and you're going to have to comprehend evil, cope with it, and conquer it. Now, of course, this comes, first of all, from the Old Testament of Judaism, then, of course, Christianity, and then Islam ripped a lot of its material off of the Jews and off of the Christians and made their own little religion. So they also have the idea that they borrowed from Judaism and Christianity that evil is real. Now, once you believe that evil is real, you've got to alleviate it for yourself. So the Judeo-Christian culture and then the Islamic culture was motivated to produce modern medicine, hospitals, a uh, way to help handicapped people, people with physical disability. Those things arise when you accept the fact that evil exists and we must deal with it and alleviate the pain and suffering of other people. So now you've answered the question. The Bible says, yes, it does exist. It's part of reality. And that according to the Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, uh, we have to deal with evil. And the prophets and Jesus, all of them said evil exists and we have to deal with it. But the moment you say it exists, you have to talk about its nature, its origin, and its attributes. In terms of its nature, is evil material or spiritual? Is it natural or only legal? See, we're going a little deeper now. Some people have said, well, evil exists, yes, as a legal fiction. In other words, they compare it to breaking the speed limit. 
breaking a 35 mile an hour speed limit is a crime punishable by a fine. But it is that way only because legally it was defined that way. Murder is evil because there are laws against it. So what is evil and what is good is what the judges and, ju and the judicial system create. Now this is where our Supreme Court right now is over here. The oligarchy of the Supreme Court said we decide whether it's good or evil to kill babies in the womb. We decide whether or not you can do this, that, or the other by legal fiat, simply by pronouncing it from uh, the, the court. And this is what Francis K. Uh, Schaeffer called judicial or arbitrary jurisprudence. Arbitrary jurisprudence says we don't care about case history, we don't care about other laws, we are now in a position that we will define what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is evil legally. Well, that has immense problems because one generation will make something illegal, and what does the next generation do? Make it legal. So that the idea of saying it's only sin is a violation of human law is not going to work. Now, we can say sin is a violation of God's law, and he's the judge, and that would work. Has there ever been a time in human history that God said it's okay to commit adultery and break the covenant of marriage? No. Has God ever said that murder is good? No. That rape is good? No. Moral laws are reflective of the nature of God, and God cannot change, hence his laws cannot change. So if you talk about human courts, no. If you talk about God deciding right from wrong, yes. Well, you also have those who believe um, that evil is natural to the world. It's mother nature, such as lightning and tornadoes and flooding, and that it's part of the evolutionary process, and it's just natural. It's evolution. No rhyme, no reason, it just happens. But it's natural because it's part of the give and flow of nature. Now, a Christian says, wait a second, before Adam fell into sin, we didn't have these things. It's because Adam fell into sin that the creation was subjected to a curse. And when Jesus comes back, the curse is removed and we have a new heavens and a new earth that doesn't have any of this nonsense. Well, again, the attempt to say it's just natural or just legal on a human level is not going to work. Then those who would say it is only spiritual in nature, that is, there are demonic evil beings, evil spirits. I have dealt with them. They do exist, people. I have had to deal with demon possession. Um, you get some real bad things going on. You also have human sense. So you have demonic evil and human evil as part of scripture. That's why evil and then the synonyms such as sin, wickedness, etc. are adjectives that describe what we think, what we do, and what we say, not what we are. What we are are creatures created in the image of God. Even the angels that fell are, first of all, angels created by God. They are acting evilly, thinking evilly, doing evilly. So sin is not a substance that you put in a can and I'd say, Brother Colin, bring me a pound of sin. Can't do that. Sin is a description of what we think, what we say, what we do, and what demons do, and what the devil does. So it is a spiritual reality that has to do with what we think and what we say and what we do. Now there are those who think it's material in nature, that matter is evil. Now that's back to Plato in the Eastern religions that said the flesh is evil. So the goal of life is to get rid of the body and become pure spirit and ascend to become a master. So they think the matter is evil. The Bible doesn't say that. Matter of fact, God created the world and he said, 
the world that I created is very good. Didn't it? The sun, the moon, the star. He said, good. So matter is not evil. Though there are those who claim that the body is evil. The body isn't evil according to God. It's what you do with the body that is evil. Same thing with those who claim that physical pain, suffering, and death are not really part of evil. Well, they are part. They are the effects of evil. So we make the difference between the nature of evil and the way it affects us. It's a description of what we say, do, and think, and it results in pain, suffering, and death. That's what evil is all about. Now, the origin of evil, those who look at it in terms of source, agent, and author, Ultimately, where does it come from? You have original evil. Where did the first evil come from? So you have to talk about the origin of it. And of course, you have those who would say God is the original source of evil. And if it's not God, then it's chance, chaos, and luck. Now here's where you must understand the genius of the Bible. The book of Job is the first biblical book. Could the devil touch a hair of Job unless God permitted him? Not a hair. Thus, Hosea said, if evil befalls a city, has not the Lord sent him? Or Job said, have we received good from the hand of God? So then let us also receive evil. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Marvelous, marvelous faith of Job. And the reality of it is that evil is not chance, chaos, and luck. It is part of God's plan for the original evil. Well, did God know that Adam and Eve would sin? I'll look at it and say yes. Well, well, if he knew, why didn't he stop it? I said, uh, well, you're asking me a why question. Scripture says no one understands the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge of God there beyond scrutiny. You expect me to tell you why God does anything. You'll meet him one day, you ask him. All I know is Adam and Eve were created and God fully knew that they would sin because he already had a plan of the Savior to come as the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent. Redemption was part of the eternal plan. Of course it was part of the plan. Well, how? Why? I said, take it up with God. Take it up with God. Can't do that. People always want to say, why and how? Well, and then why? I'm not God. Tell them, I'm not God. Neither are you. I don't answer why questions. One person said, well, why doesn't God just, you know, destroy evil? I said, because you and I would go poof, up and smoke. What? I said, you would go, you'd be a grease stain. You'd be gone. If God simply said, all evil be gone, would anybody be left? No, no. I said, no. You must understand, God is in control of his universe. What about contemporary evil? Well, the Bible says the devil does things, doesn't it? There are devils, or demons, evil spirits. Man does evil things. There are evil parts of nature. The same Hebrew word that describes evil as our sin is also used to describe when a dog attacks and kills someone. They're called an evil animal. You can have demonic animals. So the demons that came out of Legion went into what? A herd of pigs. How many of you think you could go up and pet those pigs? Or do you think they were red eyes glowing and went into the ocean for minutes? So a, you see, you can have evil animals. You can also have uh, what some people think is faith, which is not true. There's nowhere in scripture that faith is a mindless predetermination by no one. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. No, no, that's fatalism. We're talking about God's sovereignty. 
where God has a plan that ultimately amounts to his glory. What about the agent of evil, the primary and secondary? Now, a primary agent means who gave the permission for it to happen, who put it in the plan. And of course, the Bible says God did. And of course, you also have the devils making plans and making moves. But God himself is not the agent in the sense of the one who did it. Does God sin for you? I think you do fine just all by yourself. I don't need God's help to sin. I need his help not to. God is not the author of sin in the sense of the agent of sin. He does not tempt anyone to do evil, James 1. He himself is not tempted to do evil. So theologians have said the Bible clearly states that while it's part of God's plan, God is not the agent of evil. He never does evil. He doesn't lie, cheat, steal, murder. The devils do that, animals do that, and man do that, but not God. So James said, if anyone is tempted to do evil, don't you dare say that God tempted me to do it. No. The author of evil, if by author you mean agent, no, God isn't the agent. The source, well, in one sense, yes. The one who planned it, the one who sent it. But the one responsible for the evil is the agent. I am responsible for my sin. You are responsible for yours. That's the way God made it. Now, often I don't have an unbeliever, even so-called Christian. But I don't understand how God is sovereign, and yet he holds me responsible for my sin, when if he wanted to, he could have intervened and said, I didn't do it. I said, yeah, God could have controlled you. Could have been like a puppet with strength. But again, the person is asking, why? But I'm not God. If you want to know why God did something, go in prayer and ask him. Look at his work. They never do that. They never do that. They ask questions. What are the attributes of evil? You've got to make a decision whether or not divine or not divine, eternal or temporal. And you see here we begin to make it clear. Sometimes evil comes from God. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, evil is not eternal. It did not exist always. It, was, it came into existence with the physical universe. It's temporal. Um, it's absolute. When God declares something is absolutely evil, it is. It isn't relative. It's objective, not just subjective. Um, it is universal, not just cultural. It deals with the mind and the matter. It is substantial and existential. It has being and process. These are all issues that are argued in philosophy in terms of the attributes of evil. And the Bible would say, look, evil is not eternal. So Zoroastrianism is a false religion that says there was an eternal good God and eternal evil God. And you've got to have one uh, to just suppress the other. That doesn't work. It's not the biblical. Now that's metaphysics. All of these issues have to be worked out. Then we come to epistemology. It's a big word. It has to do with knowledge. <coughs> Once you decide whether or not evil exists, then you have to decide whether or not you can know it. Just saying evil exists doesn't indicate to me that you can know it. So epistemology says, is it knowable? Those who say, no, it isn't. It, it, it is unknown. Because when you look at evil, it's subjective, it's cultural, it's relative. What's evil to you is evil to you. What's good for me is good for me. That's our generation. They don't want to take a stand on anything. They want to be wishy-washy flopping. Those who say yes and no, it's objective, it's universal and absolute. The Bible gives us absolute statements so we can judge people and their actions. What about the origin of the meaning of evil? Well, God, in his revelation, in his scripture, tells us what is good and what is evil and expects us to live accordingly. It is evil to break the covenant of marriage and to commit adultery. I don't care who you are, what you are, where you are. Murder is evil. That's why God said civil laws should punish it. So there are those laws 
which reflect the moral character of God and reflect our being in the image of God that do not move and do not change. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. These laws are knowable, they're absolute, and the origin is what we get from special revelation, from God, from Scripture. Now, the humanists say, well, we actually get our meaning of evil from man. Man looking within himself to his reason. Well, it is all the way rational to his experience. Well, in my experience, mysticism, well, my feelings tell me, my heart tell me. Or phoebeism, well, I believe. And you find out very quickly most people are humanists. If you ask, what is the meaning of evil, they immediately think, well, let me tell you what I think. They're a rationalist. Let me tell you what I feel. They're a mystic. Well, let me tell you that in my experience, they're, they're into uh, what is called uh, the experientialism. And you see, when we look at meaning, we go to God's Word, the humanists can only go to themselves, and when they do, they end up in a total collapse. They cannot have any way. Intuition, reason, in the big book on natural law, I point out that people under the teaching of Scripture assume that this or that is unnatural. I'll take uh, uh, this one guy, uh, his name is Kogel, he's a great guy, has an apologetic a ministry in Southern California, but he has a big mistake. He doesn't follow the Bible, he follows what is natural. So he proclaimed on the radio, I can prove that same-sex marriages are wrong without God or the Bible. So a gay person called. He said, you're going to condemn my gay relationship without any reference to God or to the Bible. Yes, I can do that according to natural law. What you're doing is unnatural. And the guy said, no, wait a second. It would be unnatural for me to sleep with a woman. It is natural for me to sleep with a man. That is what is natural. How can you tell me that it's unnatural when it's natural? And this poor Christian got so confused and so tough because he attempted to find an absolute based on his own personal feelings of what is natural and unnatural. He also claimed he could prove that abortion was wrong without God and without the Bible. I kept telling him, without God and the Bible, he can't say squat. It is, it's open season. Go take the drugs, go die, do whatever you want. Because if God doesn't exist, the Bible isn't true, hey, there are no rules. There's nothing. There's no meaning, no significance, there's nothing. So those who look to human reason, intuition, uh -uh, or to their experiences for empiricism, their experiences in the world and in society, they're not going to be able to discover the meaning of evil. The purpose of evil. Does evil have a purpose? Well, if you are a humanist, Eastern philosophy, it doesn't exist. Well, you end up that, no, there's no purpose to evil. It's chaos and chance. Now listen to me carefully. Whatever happens by accident, you are not responsible for it. There should be no punishment. So if you have a child, how um, many of you here have still children at home? Anybody have children at home? Okay. And the child knocks over a glass of milk. Do you take out the paddle? You knocked over a glass of milk. I'm going to give you a big spanking. Hopefully not, but you say it was an accident. The child did not purposely intend to knock over the glass, it was an accident. If you're washing dishes and you drop a plate, does the person next to you say, you wicked woman, you dropped the plate. That's why insurance policies for cars, what do they now call no fault insurance because what happened was a what? Accident. 
Well, along come so-called Christian apologists, Norman Geisler, J.P. Moreland, William Lane, all of these philosophers who claim to be Christians, and they say, well, you must understand that chance and chaos are the basis of the universe. Sin happens as an accident without rhyme or reason. Now, actually, when you say that sin is an accident, are you saying we're not responsible for it then? It's a, oops, I committed adultery, but it was an accident. Can't say that. The moment you look at it and say, evil is by chance and chaos, uh-uh. If you say yes, evil has a purpose. There's a divine purpose, predestination. Uh, the devil has plans, and, and Satan, uh, they're human plans and depravity. In other words, evil is something for which you are responsible for if you premeditate. So if you are mowing your lawn, and the blade flies off your launch lawnmower and kills somebody that's called manslaughter, not murder. You probably won't even go to jail. But if you pick up your lawnmower with the blade going and go put it in his face, what is it? It's murder. Got to keep these distinctions in mind. So we look at the purpose. There is a purpose, you see, according to scripture, what did Joseph say? His brothers who threw him into jail and brought him out, sold him into slavery. He went to Potiphar. He was accused of being of a rapist who went to jail with a bad record. All of that happened to Joseph. He said, you meant it for what? Evil. But God meant it for good. The Hebrew was very clear. The very same things that the brothers were doing with the intent to cause harm to Joseph God had allowed as part of his plan. He said in order that the Jews would not die. He sat there and says, I know why God did all of this. Put me through the ringer so that the Jews would not perish with the famine. He was able to bring them to Egypt and then give them the food from the granary. Every evil that comes in your life has a purpose and a plan. It is there for a reason. That's the only way you can be sane. The moment you say, well, evil just happens, it's chaos, then there is no purpose, no plan. You can't cope with it. But if you know nothing comes into the circle of your life except God is working it for your good and the good of others and for his glory, once you understand, you can endure. That's why Job, in the end, endured, because he understood that all the evils came upon him, had ultimately come from God, though he slayed me and by uh, trust him, in order to test his faith, and in the end, there was the blessing in his life. What about does evil have any significance? Well, again, if you take the Eastern view, the humanist view, there's no, there's no significance. If you say yes, well, you must understand that you must look at it in terms of class. There's individual evil, family evil, church evil, nation, national evil, evils of the whole world, hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis. The duration of evil, evil can be temporary and eternal. So when you talk about evil, are you talking about an individual who has a temporary evil? Or are you talking about the world where there are hurricanes set loose and tornadoes? What's been happening with our country? Isn't it amazing? Over 50 tornadoes, more tornadoes have happened than happened in 100 years. God is doing something to wake this country up. But I'm afraid they're going on in their sleep. What is the solution? Can we know the solution? No, there is no solution. Once it doesn't exist or it's just a natural thing, there is no solution. Don't even try. Or you say, yes, there is a solution. The origin of it is God, not man. Christ, not yourself. It's grace, not works. It's faith, not the law. The solution to the problem of evil is going to be God through Christ, by his grace, through faith in his work 
has solved the problem of evil. And there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. No more tears. For the former things will have passed away. We'll have bodies that are incorruptible, immortal, not susceptible to pain, arthritis, bursitis, cancer, all of that. And you see, this means the nature of that solution is spiritual, not material. That's what's wrong with Roman Catholicism and the Mass. Come down and receive Christ. How? Stick up your tongue. And Christ is what? A cracker I put on your tongue. They go so far as to say to worship the host as God. Worship the cracker. Christ is not a material thing you chew with the teeth. He is a spiritual thing you receive by faith in the heart. So you receive Christ through faith into your heart, not by your teeth going to your stomach and then out. It's not material in that sense. The solution is immaterial. Here again, it is moral. It has to do with your body and your soul. That's why salvation saves your soul now, your body later. That's why you have a resurrection. Wouldn't it be great we'll all get sing our operatically? We'll have no disfigurements. We'll all be slim and beautiful and svelte and young. Whatever perfection is, don't let our world warp you into that. Whatever perfect, you will be the perfect you, whatever you are. And this all is through the work of Christ because he's paid it. Now the method, salvation and judgment, God's going to solve the problem of evil. Your body and soul will be, that issue is going to be dealt with because you have eternal and temporal things going on, human and demonic. You have partial and universal. You have exclusive and inclusive. God's solution to evil has to do with his people, not everybody. Not everybody's going to get saved because not everybody wants. You ever met someone who says, I want to go to hell? Yes. I want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want Jesus. Yes. And you think God is going to be a big bully and slap them upside the head and say, you fool. You're... He doesn't do that. And you see, the Bible clearly says there's going to be salvation and then also judgment. What he doesn't redeem, he will judge. There's a final day of judgment in which the evil will be quarantined in a place called Gehenna or hell, and it will never break out of that concentration camp. There will no longer be any evil in the universe. He will gather all the evil spirits and all the evil angels and put them in there. He'll gather all the evil people and put them in there. And how long are they there for? Scripture says forever and ever. And these shall go into everlasting life. So the solution to the problem of evil is that Christ on the day of judgment will place them in eternal hell where they will bear the consequences of the evil they thought, they said, and they did. On the other hand, salvation is the other way to solve it. And it was solved by his grace through the work of Jesus Christ. Now one person one time said, well, why did God save everybody? Now again, what are they asking? A why question. Take it up with God. Well, on the day of judgment, I have a word to say with him. I said, go ahead. Scripture says on that day, every mouth will be what? Shut. Shut. If God wanted to save everybody, he could. Anybody here think that God couldn't? Mercy can. If God didn't want, I said, matter of fact, you're asking the wrong question. I love this with I'm dealing with baby. Why doesn't God save anyone? I said, no. Why does he save anyone? I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be saved. I'm a rat. I'm a bum. I still am. I'm evil. I do evil things. I think evil thoughts. I do evil things. Tell my wife at times evil thoughts. I give her evil words. Why?
why in the world would God still love me? Well, see, that's the, the greater mystery. Why does he say anybody? It's like Charles Spurgeon had just preached a lecture on predestination, and as the 6,000 people came out of this church, a belligerent man said, and why does God save some with that bulldog? Spurgeon always had a, a very good way of answering. He looked at him and says, no, no, the question is, why does God save any? The mystery is he bothered to save anyone. We all deserve to go to hell. We should just let us all go to hell. Let us kill each other and get over with. But he didn't. He decided to send his son to save him. That's the mystery. It is mystery more than God would die for us, you see. What about, we looked at the knowledge of evil. What about the ethics of evil? You have to think about this morals. You have to deal with whether or not evil, temporal, eternal, relative, absolute, subjective, objective, cultural. You have to understand that evil as scripture decides it, and evil can be changed into a good. The evil things that happened to Jesus Christ, was it evil that they lied about him? Yes. That they brought false testimony. They paid people to give false testimony. That he was tried and judged in a kangaroo court, that was evil. That they beat the Son of God, was evil. That they crucified the Son of God, that they hung him on the tree. The deicide, the murder of Jesus was evil, but without that, you and I wouldn't be here, and we call the night, the day on which he was crucified, Wednesday, Friday. Because it was good for us and evil for him. God takes what we look at as pain and suffering and can turn it around and use it for his glory. How many of you have ever read the book, The Queen of Darkness, Christianity Side? I took my children to visit her home in Lancaster, showed them the windows painted black. A woman who had malaria of the bone marrow. The, the light of a match caused excruciating pain. She had to live in the darkness. She accepted the physical evil and used it for God's glory. And people came from all over the world. Are you Christian inside? How can you live in darkness and not be a bitter woman and hate God? And she would share the gospel. She won more people to Jesus Christ in that dark house through the evil that afflicted her than she would have ever done if she didn't have I was a friend of Corrington Boone. She was a, a woman we loved deeply out in California. I have a friend, uh, his wife, his, his mother, was the caretaker. Now, if you say, Cory Tibo, was it evil that you and your family were taken into the concentration camp? Yes. Was it evil that they killed your sister? Yes. Was it evil that your daddy died? Yes. Was the Holocaust evil and the killing of the Jews? Yes. But has God used all of this to bring great good and great glory? Yes. And she said, my life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors. He worketh steadily. Oftentimes he chooses sorrow, and I am foolish pride. Forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. Not till the moon is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. God would not send the darkness if he felt we could bear the light. We would not cling to his guiding hand if the way were always bright. So he sends the blinding darkness and the furnace sevenfold heat is the only way, believe me, to keep you close to the Master's feet.
Give me a true Christian in the wine press of adversity and pain and suffering. Give me someone who's not really a Christian. And as the presses begin to crush them down, let's say two old ladies, both with arthritis and the pain, the pain, and they get arthritic. And they, one, you visit her in the nursing home. Praise Jesus. How are you getting along? I'm just trusting Jesus every day. The other one, I hate God. It's not fair. Why did I have it? I... When a person is crushed by evil, either out comes the wine of God's blessing or the gall and bitterness of being not saved. You have to understand how people who suffer the same thing, death of parents, to work, can react differently. It's by understanding that what looks as evil can end up as something good. And it comes from God. Is evil always evil? No. Is evil sometimes good? Yes. Can evil become good? Yes. Can, evil, can good become evil? I think about that. Here, this girl says, oh, I want to marry him. I know he's a Catholic. He's not a Christian, but I want to marry him. I want to marry him. I've got to have him. It would be so wonderful. I'm praying every day, Lord. Man. I've got to marry him. She marries him. She said, I got the good thing I wanted. But what was it in the end? It was evil. It was evil. She sinned, married an unbeliever. Her children were not raised in the faith. She stopped going to any church. I've seen it a hundred times. People think, I want this. It's good. I need it. And they get it, and they find out it's evil. Don't always think you get what you wish for. Say what, you, what is good. Lastly, the aesthetics of evil, its existence, its nature. Does beauty exist? What is its nature? What are the standards? Beauty and evil. What this simply means is that those who, don't, who say that evil do not exist, they say that beauty doesn't exist. Ugliness does not exist. It's all relevant. What is beautiful to you is in the eye of the beholder. It's all relative, subjective. That's where humanism has gone. But the Bible says no. Beauty and ugliness do exist because art comes from God. When someone says beauty is in the eye of the beholder, I said is I will agree with that as long as you put a capital B on the word behold. See, the humanist says, well, uh, there's a flower that blooms in the desert and no one ever see it. It's beautiful. I said, yes, because God sees it. David plucking his heart in the middle of the night, heart, singing, the Lord is my shepherd, is beautiful because God hears it. God hears the sound of the log falling in the, in the woods. Something is not beautiful because people exist. They were beautiful before we came along. Ugliness is ugliness. I don't care what you say. New York City had an art exhibit where they had a naked man holding the intestines and organs of a pig on himself. And they said modern art. Or a crucifix and a bottle of urine. I'm, I'm sorry, no, that's ugly. That's foul. That's mean. That's stupid. That's hideous. And you see there are standards. But you must understand this one point from this whole section. There's a beautiful side to evil. And young men must understand. They think that beauty means good, ugliness, or just normal looks mean bad. So when they start looking for a girl to get married, they only look for the prettiest girl in the church. Because what are they assuming? The better looking the girl is, the more good they will get, when often it's the reverse. The reverse. That's why scripture says you pick a husband or a wife based on their character. Proverbs 31. As I trained my children, you don't look at their physique, you look at their character. And you marry someone who, according to the scriptures, is a God-fearing righteous person and you'll never have to worry about them cheating on you. But so often people marry for looks. Looks can be what? Deceiving. Something that's beautiful can be evil. Don't assume 
that witches must be evil. They can be good looking. But we assume this because of uh, Walt Disney. And you see, you have all of these standards and ideas, but we're given in scripture that ugliness is not automatically evil. That's ugliness is this relative thing of culture. We must not judge things according to external judgment, Jesus said, but judge a righteous judgment according to the character. If Christian people would marry according to character, Proverbs 31 and Ephesians 5, we wouldn't have as many divorces in the church today as there are in the world. You realize that? The evangelical church has as many divorces today as happens outside of the church. Now, that wasn't when I was a kid. Any of you older geezers here? It used to be, I could boast, that in our, in our service, we don't have unwed mothers and we don't have divorce. And we can say that any longer. He used to say, we don't have drug addicts in our churches. Then I went to minister in California. Had an assistant who was an alcoholic and I didn't know it. Whiskey, drinking during the day. Then other people in the church had confessed to snorting coke and doing drugs and sitting in the pew listening to me. Why? The beautiful <coughs> side of evil is that evil can be very alluring. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, unsafe people, to lure you to betray the God who made you. Now this gives you just a little idea of all the issues that come about. Does anyone have a question? Because we're, we are finished. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just wonder whether you have any publication of what you have. No, I don't. I've been trying to figure out. I made this in California, and they made it after it staples or something, and they made it for me. Uh, but moving from California, we lost lost uh, the com hard computer that had this, plus a bunch of other material. So we do not have a copy of this in our computer anymore. If any of you are a computer whiz and can tell me, how can we take this to somebody who has a machine that can read it and put it into the computer, then it'd be on a stick and then we could make a smaller version of it. I don't know how to do it, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm back from the day of the abacus <laughs> and uh, beating of drums, and we use smoke signals. Uh, I was a geek with the slide rule, and can they call me, uh, not geek, in those days we were called, what was it, uh, nerds? No, that was later. Uh, what were the ones with the slide rule in the pocket in the 60s and 50s? What were we called then? Nobody here remembers? <laughs> But they were calling us names because we were the guys with the slide rules. But see, I, I don't know, but say if, if any of you can think of how it can be done, I'm prepared to let uh, Jimmy have it. Jimmy, raise your hand. If you think you could get it done and get it back without destroying it, that cost me $200. That cost $200. But when you see it all, you can understand better if you just saw the part. Now, do you, one, do you see all the issues involved? Do you see how scripture answers these things? Yes, ma'am. When you mentioned about comfort in the knowledge of evil, I think if I understand what you said, you would prefer the more reasons of evil, right? And I just want to ask you like, your explanation. Sin usually is explained as depression, right? Pardon me? Sin. Sin is explained as depression. Uh, Sin, humanly speaking, is irrational for this reason. You should only do that which is in your best interest. Sin is never in your best interest because it brings the judgment of God. But people who rob banks, they don't care about God, so they think it is in their best interest to go rob the bank to get money. Okay. My question is, uh, when you talk about there are reasons of evil, and you said that that makes it think, Makes a person think. That's how yes. you. I yes. But it's definitely really from the belief of God. So that is really what I want to put an explanation from you. How can evil is a sin? Can make a person think? 
Okay, all right. It, it has to do with the coping. The coping. The coping. All right. Okay. As you cope with divorce, how many of you have had friends who have gone through a very ugly divorce? Anybody here? Or your parents divorced, but you're the product of a broken home. One person can go through a divorce and they cope with it and go on and live a happy life, maybe remarry, maybe not. The other person goes through the same kind of divorce and for the rest of their life they get more bitter and angry and they can't forgive and they, their lives end in destruction and pills and depression and value. In other words, if you do not know how to cope with evil when it comes your way, it leaves you alive. This is why I can forgive people. People who do evil things to me. I can't forgive them for what they do to you. But I can look at the farmer who was driving the truck and was berserk. He went into my lane. I broke the leg both places, broke the knee, broke the hip. The socket is gone. My leg is attached by a chain. I, I had the, the inside. It crushed the organs. They, I lost the the gallbladder, the appendix, half the liver, the spleen was damaged. Now all of this, and it took me a year to walk on a cane. Well, thank you for the explanation, but I almost feel it's still fair to say it's the grace of God oh, yes. that makes me think. Yes, you know, oh no, 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 this is how God's grace works. But God uses means, and he tells you, I love you. Mm -hmm. You're going through the fire. But that fire is going to refine you. And the dross will come up and be skimmed away and you will be pure gold and pure silver. David said it was good for me that the Lord had afflicted me. I would have gone astray. So if you look at Isaiah, as Israel went through the captivity and the horrors of it, murder, rape, slavery, being exiled in another country, he said, don't worry, I love you. There's an old song that is built from that passage, some through the water, some through the flood, some through great fire, but what? All through the blood. God leads his dear children along. All I know is that I can cope with whatever the devil or man of the world throws at me. Come on! Because nothing can touch me except my father says, it's good for you. One day you'll understand. I talk about it as sandpaper. Any of you ever build a wood table or work with wood? You start out with a rough sandpaper, and then you get a finer sandpaper. And when we have evil things that happen to us, you lose your job, you don't have money. Those are sandpaper. And what's happening is he's making you into the image of Jesus and he's sanding and sanding and sanding and get rid of the molds and the warts and what's keeping you from looking like Jesus. So I accept. It's like they say, the Armenian and the Calvinist fell down the stair. The Armenian did not believe God was sovereign, so he got up and, why me? Why me? The Calvinist got up and said, whew, I'm glad that's over with. What's next? Because he knew there was a purpose, a reason, a rhyme. Nothing in life is meaningless. And of course, that's what the book of Ecclesiastes, that's what the book of Proverbs, the Bible, as I put out, clearly says to everything there is a reason, a meaning, there is significance. So I can deal with it without becoming depressed, losing my mind, killing myself. Why do you know, people suicide? Two people experience the same problem. One kills himself. That's irrational. And it's God's grace as he enables us to understand the Lord is my shepherd. He's leading me. Sometimes he leads me through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't like it in there. Though, oh my, there's tigers and bears. And oh my. But I know in the end he will lead me home. Yes, sir. One person, yes, absolutely. Yes, it is very true. So scripture would talk about 
for even dogs. He would say, this dog is evil, it must be destroyed. This bull who killed somebody with the horns, he must be destroyed, it's evil. And then it also says, this man is evil, and he must be destroyed. So the reason the Bible talks about capital punishment, some people are so evil, the only way to deal with them is to kill them. And see, we have forgotten this rude reality. It's like with the terrorists. The only good terrorist is what? A dead one. You say, Dr. Buck, I worked with Homeland Security. I was an advisor for naval intelligence, for the FBI. I have dealt with these people. If they had their way, they would slit every one of our throats. I'm not saying every good Muslim is a bad Muslim. There are Muslims who are not, well, they don't care about that. Every terrorist, serial rapist, they should be removed from society. Some people are more evil than others. Absolutely. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, Jacob's son, uh, Judah, he has two sons, they were killed, right? God decided, yeah. to, uh, are they the, the examples of evil inside out? Well, you know, as you go through scripture, you find Jacob I love, Esau I hate. And there was good reason for hating both of them. I always tell people the mystery, why would he love that scandal? Jacob, two-timing, blind, flip flanning con man. So to me, that passage isn't a mystery to me that God was angry with uh, Esau. The mystery to me is he had any grace and mercy on Jacob. If anything, he was the worst of the true brothers. So there are evil people in the world. As you go through scripture, you will find indication that God deliberately moved at this or that. Take the evil kings. One way of easily remembering Old Testament history is North, South, Israel, Judah, 1920-08. Does anybody know what I just said? North, South. Which was in the north? Israel. What was in the south? Judah. 19, kin, 19 kings, 20 kings, zero godly kings, eight godly kings. So it's north, south, Israel, Judah, 1920, zero, eight. Hey, got it. The bad kings meant, uh, meant bad ends. Jezebel was thrown out to one of the dogs, like her blood. Yeah, it's very true. That particular being an example of the two sons doesn't strike me as earth shaking. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I had an experience <coughs> first night that I visited a church, and the minister said, when you come back, I said, of course, because I want to find out how they got the jewelry there, but I didn't say anything. That night, I was going into bed and covering myself, and I stopped in my tracks. Of course, at the foot of my bed was a figure in white, bald head, and he said, Christianity is Christ, you saw him. Now, you're thinking on that one. And from there on, Okay, that's what we call Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> what we mean is this. We all have weird experiences that we will wait till heaven for the Lord to decide. If that bald figure told you Jesus wasn't the answer, that would be a thing. If it said Christ is this, that, or the other, I don't know if it's your medication or not. It was a good message, but put it in the section of the brain and say, I don't know. People ask me questions all the time. Says I don't know. Well, did you, did you would all. I said I never claimed I know. <laughs> I know what the Bible teaches. I don't know. Don't ask me. I said if I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. I said I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. God knows. Well, we leave those in the hands I of the Lord. Get the follow up on that. And there was a visiting president of upstate New York here at a Christian college. And he gave an invitation, and I didn't want to raise my hand because I figured they'd take me for a glory seat or something, and I didn't want to be known as that, maybe because I was a Jewish believer. So, all those who raised their hand, please step forward. Now, 
I was embarrassed walking up there, and I said, I guess I'm supposed to make a public profession of my faith. Well, the whole thing was unbiblical with these all the This is the completion. When I said that, all of a sudden, everyone looked beautiful to me who did that church. Everyone. Hey, Ripley's, believe it or not. Yes, and I want to go further on that one. So this doesn't really have to do with I, evil. I, and years, and what happened was, I felt years younger than my age at that point, because I still remember 33, and I felt like a teenager. And my wife got you, she said, I don't know where you got this joy from, wherever you got to go with you. And I was witnessing to him. Well, it's so, called endorphins. Pardon? Endorphins. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we all have these experiences, brother, and we just cherish them and just go on and don't live on the past. Look to look with oh, the Lord. Amen. Any other? Well, I know we went, I only wanted to do 45 minutes. Thank you very much. If you found this helpful, would you please, should I write a book and explain all of this? Yeah. That's a lot of work. <laughs> I have to footnote all of these people. That evil doesn't exist, but I need to have a footnote so you know that what I'm saying is true. Thank you very much.